Good afternoon and welcome to the webinar on returning to campus for college students with intellectual and other developmental disabilities, an educational perspective. We are honored that Dr. Molly K. Rarick Day accepted the invitation to present today. Before I officially introduce our presenter, please allow me to address a few logistical items. I'm Will Francis, Project Director for Post-Secondary Education at the UCLA Tarjan Center. The Tarjan Center at UCLA is a federally designated center for excellence in developmental disabilities and your host for today's webinar. Support for today's webinar comes from the California Community College's Chancellor's Office through a contract that enables us to provide technical assistance and training to community colleges DSPS who are working to provide equitable supports, services, and opportunities for students with disabilities including intellectual disability and autism. Your participation today is much appreciated. Some of our institutions are reevaluating the safety and related concerns of returning to face-to-face -face instruction and services. It is important to think about the range of student support needs and the array of resources both on and off our campuses that may be deployed to assist students to pursue their academic and workforce development goals. We are happy to provide this webinar today. We hope that you will find the content useful and applicable in your work in supporting students. A number of our colleagues are unable to attend today's webinar and have requested a recording of the proceedings. In order to facilitate access to a clean recording of the webinar, we have muted all calls. As we proceed through today's webinar, our presenter would love to respond to questions that arise from or that are related to the content of the presentation. Please take a minute to look at the bottom of the Zoom program display where you will find a chat or text box. We are asking that you insert your questions into the chat box or in the Q&A throughout the duration of the webinar. We will address your questions and welcome you to submit as many questions as naturally arise. Our presenter may stop occasionally to address your questions, and we're asking for you to insert your questions into the chat at any time. This may be a good time to test the chat function. If you would like, please insert a greeting into the chat box. Thank you. Now I will provide some information about our presenter. Dr. Molly K. Rarick Day is an educator, researcher, and nonprofit leader. Her current roles include founder and educational director of Ignite Collective Inc. She also is an adjunct faculty at California State University Northridge in the Graduate School of Education. She's an educational consultant, adjunct trainer and advisory board member with Elevators Training. She's a volunteer Nordic ski instructor and advisory council member for Disabled Sports Eastern Sierra. Also an uh, external advisor, advisory board member of the Colorado School of Mines Robotics Program. And she is a board member and director of partnerships and outreach for PairBots, a technology nonprofit. Dr. Rarick Day holds a doctoral degree in educational leadership, a master's of science in special education, and a bachelor of arts in elementary education. She has taught in Massachusetts and California and presents at conferences throughout the United States. Her areas of interest include communication support, relationships and sexuality, higher education, transitioning to adulthood, inclusive education and outdoor adventures. During the COVID-19 pandemic, Dr. Rarick Day has collaborated with self-advocates, families, educators, therapists, and others to develop and implement inclusive and accessible best practices. And now without further ado, here is Dr. Molly K. Rarick Day. Thank you, Will. I'm gonna share my screen and then get the presentation going. There we go. Are we able to see that okay? 
I'm going to take that as a yes. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, it's great to be back. I've um, presented a couple times with some other wonderful presenters here. Um, and it's really nice to be back in, in a different situation and talking about how that we can support people heading back to school, um, if that's their choice. Um, so uh, Will already told you all about me. Um, something that I realized was not in my bio is that I'm also a family member um, of a young adult, a college-aged adult with autism uh, who does not speak. He types to communicate. Um, and so I think that in addition to all of the work that I do, uh, it's really important for me to realize how this has affected him as well and how, you know, what we can learn from uh, people like my family member. Um, so I'm also going to be weaving in some of that. Uh, so I'm going to share what I have learned from self-advocates, people with disabilities, about what has been going on, um, how they're feeling about returning to campus, um, concerns that they have, excitements that they have, um, and what we can do sort of uh, educationally to support that. Um, and so when doing some research for this, I came across a number of articles, and you'll notice at the bottom of my slides, um, they're cited and then I also have a list of resources at the end um, and I can send I have sent that all to Will um, so if that's made available then you should just be able to to um, read them on your own as well um, and so I think you know short of me sharing my experience I think it's really important for us to listen to what people with disabilities are feeling um, and so we know this from self-advocates we know this from families we know this from teachers who have heard things from students um, and and so uh, I, that's what I'd really like to listen to. Um, so this first quote uh, is from the Washington Post. You'll notice at the bottom from November of 2021, so uh, just a few months ago. Um, and this person um, is, a, I believe, a graduate student. And she says, many students welcome the return to in-person learning, but the change has revived pre-pandemic pre difficulties and created new ones for some students with disabilities. Some lamented the reduction of online instruction, which allowed them to read closed captions during lectures in real time, turn off their cameras uh, when they needed, and watch recorded lectures at home and at their own pace, among its benefits. Losing that flexibility, the student says, um, has brought them physical and mental distress and the feeling that they're being forgotten. I have to work 10 times harder than my classmates just to be able to succeed, and yet I'm not being supported, said this student. Um, this really spoke to me uh, in a way that, uh, you know, we, we have heard from students that being online has been really helpful for a lot of them um, in many ways, not so helpful in other ways. Um, but this idea that they're being forgotten, being left behind, um, really struck at my heart. Um, I think we're all here because we are trying to support people with disabilities um, and to have them saying, you know, these things that, that they don't feel noticed, they don't feel um, included, they feel forgotten um, is, is really striking. Um, so we need to figure out how we can help people know that they, we're thinking about them, um, know that they're not being forgotten. Um, and, you know, I'm not here to teach you how to teach things, um, but what do we need to do before you're teaching um, those academic subjects so that people have those feelings again? Um, so we also know from self-advocates that people are feeling a really wide range of emotions. Um, people are feeling nervous about going back, feeling anxious, scared, confused, unsure, excited, eager, and lonely all at the same time. Um, so we know nervousness, anxiousness, um, unsure, uh, feelings of being unsure come from um, not maybe knowing what's going to be required um, of people when they return, maybe not uh, you know, having been away from school for so long that they're not sure what's expected, have things changed, um, and along with confused, those are all very uh, related feelings. Then there's feelings of being excited and eager. Um, a lot of those come, we know, from people wanting to see their peers again and interact with people and uh, interact with teachers and do those social things on campus and uh, go to the gym and go to the theater and all this stuff that hasn't been available for so long. Um, but it's important to know that those feelings 
can exist at the same time um, and can really get in the way of academics. Um, so as an educator, I'm not a therapist, as an educator, I see all these things and I think, um, you know, how are those going to show up in my classroom um, and how can we address each of these things? And we know, especially with people with disabilities and with everybody, that these things show up um, in different ways in different people. Uh, and we need to be pretty aware of who our students are and, um, uh, how we might see that, how we might address that, how we might support them in a way that we have not before. Uh, so some of the things that we've learned are doing things related to social emotional learning, which I know is kind of a buzzword in K through 12, uh, but it also relates to where we are talking about higher education. Um, so doing something like a daily check in, and this does not just have to be for students with disabilities, this can be with all your students, um, either having, you know, asking a couple students how they're feeling uh, to, to volunteer how they're feeling, um, doing something like journaling, um, if that's an option either on a computer or writing or someone can uh, dictate a journal entry how they're feeling that day um, especially as it relates to being back on campus um, taking some time to do teachable uh, to take advantage of teachable moments like we do in any uh, classroom so if you see someone having a hard time or having an awesome time uh, how can we look at that and um, bring that to all of our students um, so if someone comes in and they're like cannot wait to be back in the classroom and they're so excited um, and maybe a little dysregulated as a result um, super super thrilled to see everybody um, how can we take that moment to work on maybe some self-management tools, some mindfulness tools, um, something to help re-regulate ourselves. And that um, applies to everybody. Uh, and taking that as a celebration, certainly, that we're back on campus. And then how can we um, kind of manage ourselves back into being into a classroom? Um, another thing that's really important uh, that I sort of touched on is peer interactions. So people have been really lonely. People have been missing their peers. Um, people uh, are just like craving that social interaction and are maybe overexcited for it um, and also maybe really nervous about it and maybe forgot um, how to have those interactions. So if you're in a position or, or maybe you're mentoring someone who's in a position where they can um, step back and kind of reteach or resupport how to have peer interactions that can be really helpful um you know talking about giving people physical space asking you know if you're so excited to see your friend and you really want to hug them uh how to ask for consent before doing that these things may not have been practiced in a couple of years now um so we want to make sure that we're supporting people not shaming them for you know not having the opportunity to practice um, and practicing in your classrooms um, so along with that modeling, um, so for yourself, you can talk about how you're feeling that day, um, if things are hard for you, if you're nervous about um, coming back to campus, if you are um, wearing a mask and it's not comfortable, um, if you're worried about other people making different decisions than you, um, you could take all of those things and really model for your students um, what you know, you can do and show them how they can uh, respect their peers like you're respecting them. Um, and also noticing your own emotions. Um, I'm feeling so excited to see all you and I'm feeling, you know, full of energy. Uh, and I really need to, whew, let's all take a breath. <sighs> do things that, um, you know, that you can show that work for you that may also work for your students. Um, and that pulls right into self-management tools. Um, so taking breaks, taking um, deep breaths, um, doing check-ins is a self-management tool. Um, if you notice that maybe some students, especially um, whose bodies don't listen as well, um, so like my family member who has autism, his body does not listen to him very well. Uh, he gets up and jumps around and needs some time to move. Um, and that's gonna be a lot harder going back into a physical classroom versus being at home or wherever um, where that's you know no one is disturbed by you um, having to move your body um, so as one example how can then that student be helped in managing that um, and it's probably not going to happen the first day right it's been a long time since people have been in classrooms physical classrooms um, so how can we sort of work up to um, a time where hopefully that student is able to manage better and be in the classroom um, 
along with emotions, right? So self-management regarding emotions. Um, if you're feeling very overwhelmed by an assignment or something that happens socially, um, what can we do to uh, provide tools for those kind of students as well who are experiencing that? So it may be talking with that student um, or that student and family or counselor, or whoever knows that student really well, um, and helping to reintegrate um, some of those tools that they maybe had before uh, or introducing new tools as well. Um, and I know we talk a lot about returning to campus and those kind of things. Um, we also need to think that some students have never been to campus. Um, some students have been going to college for two years online, and that's really different. Um, where I teach at Cal State Northridge, we teach student teachers who usually take about two years to finish the program, and some of them I've never met. Some of them have never actually been in our physical classroom. Um, so while they're teaching in person, they're not going to school in person. And so that's a big difference too. Um, so for someone maybe who finished high school or a transition program uh, and then was transitioning to college and COVID happened, um, they may have never been in a classroom. So you might need to um, take some more time to teach these things, uh, not assuming that they already have the skills. Uh, and so the modeling comes in there too, right? So then we're looking at how can these students who have been in classrooms before model some of these tools and these techniques for new students. Okay. Oh, good, it's gonna play. All right, can I make sure, I tested this already, but Will, if you can tell me and make sure you can hear the sound, that would be great. Quite often see is that staff or people who are with somebody with a disability, um, who may be upset or maybe just mention a friend of them who's died often the the reaction to that is the staff or the person who's with them trying to make the person happy again to jolly them along and to say something cheerful yes but they're in heaven now so they're looking down on us and isn't it good that or Oh, I'm missing my support worker who's left. Yes, but you've got a lovely new support worker. Isn't that nice? And to ignore that sadness and to make everything immediately happy. Now, of course, I'm sure the new support worker is nice. It may well be that dad is happy in heaven, but that person is sad about it. And just acknowledge that and say, yes, it is sad. That's all. <laughs> Takes maybe a couple of minutes. Yeah. Do you want to say anything more? Shall we look at some pictures of that or of the support worker who's left? Shall we have a cup of tea? A few minutes and then you can join the person along, but please don't do it immediately. When somebody tells you something that affects them, that makes them sad, just give them a few minutes to be sad before you put the kettle on. If you haven't heard of open future learning, that's a great resource. Um, and what spoke to me about that was the idea that people, students Fine. are gonna come to you with a lot of baggage trauma. Um, like I say, I'm not a therapist, whatever you wanna call it. They had a lot of experiences that have been really hard um, and they're gonna wanna talk about it. Um, I'm sure most of you are also not counselors or therapists, uh, but they're gonna need people to talk to about what has happened and how, what they've experienced and their thoughts and fears and um, you know, potentially having lost family members or friends um, as well as uh, you know, an enormous amount of feelings about going back into the community and um, things they might be hearing on the news or from the family or um, things that um, friends are telling them um, all kind of mixed together with feelings of excitement about seeing people at the same time. Um, so what I hear from that is the idea of don't shut somebody down when they come to you with that. Um, it might be uncomfortable for you too. I'm a very sensitive person uh, and I, you know, I feel feelings very much. Um, so having people come with their feelings can be a lot too, um, but not kind of just 
saying, oh, you know, that's too bad, or hey, you know, we're supposed to be in class, let's not talk about it. Um, this has been a very big deal for all of us. Um, and so listening to people, hearing people is really important, because um, they're not going to be able to access academics if that's what's going on in their head all the time, if they're so worried about everything and having big feelings about everything. Um, so I know that's asking a lot of educators uh, to play, you know, multiple roles, uh, but we find that it's really important that people are heard and that their experiences are um, honored. Um, so another good quote that I found, and you'll um, see again the, the reference down there, this one is from Canada, um, which is um, uh, expressing something very similar to the first one. Um, so this person said, or this writer said, disabled students have told us that over the pandemic, they experienced access to university education in ways that did not exist pre-pandemic through virtual access, lectures being recorded and deadlines being more flexible. So very similar to the other student. Uh, disabled students are sounding the alarm that a return to campus is both shutting down that access and that it doesn't respect health risks that could have long-term and dire consequences for both disabled and non-disabled students. Um, so this uh, uh, publication seems to have interviewed a bunch of people, have done um, some data collection. You can look at the actual um, article to see more information about that. But in very similar ways to that first quote, um, students are not feeling supported. Students are kind of... Um, missing having the access to do school online. Um, and I know some some classes are still available online, but uh, in this talk, we're specifically addressing uh, in-person supports. So I was curious, you know, all of this wonderful access that occurred online, how can we kind of translate that into in-person supports? Um, so this person talks about lectures being recorded, deadlines being more flexible. Uh, the other person talked about closed captioning and some other accessibility things. Um, and I know, for example, what we're doing right now, there's closed captioning available um, as well. So how do we translate that into on-campus, in-person teaching. So the same article um, asked students, you know, what what are those happening that is so useful that we can put into practice? Um, so again, if you want to, if you wanted to check that out, the link is down here, and the graphic is um, a screenshot from that. Um, so they talk about using a combination of asynchronous and synchronous lectures, which we know online means um, having some things recorded that you can watch on your own time, and then having some um, available uh, or some required synchronously. So together at the same time. Um, and the students wrote here, create a middle ground between asynchronous and synchronous lecture, bleh, excuse me, lectures to give students some form of student professor communication. Um, so they didn't like having everything be asynchronous. They missed that connection. Um, so coming back to the campus, you're going to be able to have that connection, uh, but you're also kind of losing that flexibility of being able to watch things on their own time, um, maybe rewatch lectures, right, if someone um, maybe didn't process it or was having trouble paying attention the first time. Um, so how can we do that in live teaching? Uh, right, so this may be a combination of you if you are in the classroom um, doing lectures, maybe a combination of you doing that all together at one time traditionally for everybody um, and then thinking creatively like, hmm, uh, maybe this week I have recorded a short video of myself talking about a topic or interviewing somebody um, or some other, you know, uh, content related thing um, that students can watch while they're still in the classroom, but maybe they have their own time in their own headphones um, or something like that where they can sort of take their time um, to review that content. So the same thing with um, captions can uh, uh, um, apply to that as well. So if it's something that you have recorded, uh, there's many tools that you can use to caption those um, lectures. And then maybe it's available if you're using a, a platform like Canvas or something else where um, people are able to just um, do that at their own rate. 
Um, the second thing that students talked about was using scaffolded learning, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, so creating opportunities for students to build on their understanding of course concepts, and then they specifically write through smaller evaluations. Um, so this is something students really liked online. Uh, so how are we translating it? So smaller evaluations, depending on your course, of course, um, whether it's writing an essay or taking an exam or putting together a project, um, whatever that may be. What are the steps that lead up to that, that you can give students feedback on before they end up with the final product? Um, and then that pulls right into opportunities for feedback. Um, so along with kind of smaller steps rather than one big final evaluation, um, this purple one, Opportunities for Feedback, says allow students to submit assignments for feedback prior to submitting the final version to create opportunities for success. Um, I know that's something that we do in our program. Um, if someone is doing an assignment and they want feedback, um, and most of our students don't have disabilities, but some do, um, anybody is able to give us their assignment ahead of time so we won't go through and grade the whole thing um obviously then we'll be doing you know all kinds of uh grading all the time rather than other stuff um, but we go through and look and say hey you know can we think more about this section um can make sure to run a spell and grammar check um whatever sort of feedback the student is going to benefit from um, and so it sounds like students were getting a lot of that online and now they're really looking forward to that in person as well. Um, and then the fourth one here in red with the check mark says uh, opportunities to distribute marks. And again, so this is in Canada. So they're talking about grades, distributing grades. Um, so offer participation grades to distribute the weightage of assignments and exams uh, with traditionally heavy weights. Um, so my understanding is, of this is talking about courses that maybe have um, uh, just a midterm and final exam maybe. Um, so all of the grading comes from those two assignments. Um, or maybe a couple big papers or something like that. Um, so they're asking that in classes like that, could we also get um, points for participating, for showing up, for being part of a discussion, um, in, in addition to uh, having those really heavily weighted assignments. Um, and I'm guessing that if you're at a community college, um, that may be not be the case, but it's something important to think about that, that students are feeling a lot of stress about um, you know, only having a couple um, times to show what they know. Um, so again, you're welcome to head to this website. Um, I just took a screenshot. I did not create this. Uh, and it was really helpful to see what students thought was helpful. Um, and then the final comment says, offer a space for support, a space to chat, and for students to discuss course material with their peers. Um, so this was something, again, that happened. It seemed a lot more online than it had previously in person. Um, so thinking about how we can create this sort of space for students when we are in person. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean you taking class time to say, hey, let's chat. It might, and that's fine. Um, I like to chat with my students. But it also could look like, um, encouraging students to set up a time to meet at the library together or the cafe on campus together or what have you um, so that they can reconnect personally and then talk about assignments as well um, and they're talking lots about support chatting um, you know reconnecting with each other okay um, so as we are transitioning back from online learning to in-person learning. Um, some other considerations are to uh, pay additional attention to accommodations. Um, so this could be for students that you've had before, students who are in the system already, who already know, hey, I need um, a lot of extra time on tests. I need um, someone to help me take notes. Um, could be, uh, I need someone to be in class with me to help me um, get around physically. Uh, and I need time to move my body, um, you know, captions, it could be, you know, all these accommodations, but really paying attention to, to students 
and making sure that they know um, what accommodations they have the right to and how to use them. And some students who've done this before may not remember how to uh, access accommodations. They might not remember how to say, I need extra time on a test. Um, can I please go take it in the um, testing office? Um, and then new students too, who've never experienced this again, because they've been home for two years, um, how to get that access. Um, so I know, again, this is a lot on, on teachers, um, but it's going to make everybody more successful and independent as we go on. Um, so similarly, reteaching of self-advocacy skills. Um, so how to speak up for themselves, if that is for accommodations, or it could be for, um, you know, can I please go sit in a different part of the room? Uh, it could be, um, I need to take a break, I'm feeling overwhelmed. All of those self-advocacy skills that when you're at home, it's really easy to turn off your camera and stand up and go to the bathroom or take a break or get a drink or whatever you may need. Um, and that is going to be really different in a physical classroom where someone's expecting you to say, I'm overwhelmed, I need to go take a break or what have you. Um, so giving students some grace and realizing that these are things that need to be repracticed um, and then modeling them uh, and giving feedback on how to use those skills. So related to that also, um, reminders of in-person classroom expectations. Um, again, super different from home. Uh, you know, uh, it might be we need to sit up at a desk. We can't be, you know, lounging around on the floor. Um, it could be um, you need to raise your hand before you talk. You know, on Zoom, you could digitally raise your hand or maybe just jump in. It might be different. Um, if you're excited to be around people, some of those expectations might be giving people space, um, you know, not talking about personal stuff while we're doing class, uh, you know, whatever sort of expectations you have in your uh, specific classroom. Um, and then considerations for how online skills can be used in a physical classroom. So um, super cool is that a lot of our students learned a lot of computer skills while they were home um, doing class, right? So um, thinking about how those can be used. So is there access to tablets or laptops or other sorts of computers where um, students can keep using their typing skills um, instead of writing? Maybe they could type notes. Um, uh, things like muting and unmuting. Um, I've heard some people are are kind of using signals to be like, now's the time when we should all be muted, um, kind of using Zoom nomenclature uh, uh, versus now's a time where we can all be unmuted and just be talking. Um, so transferring those uh, into uh, in-person interactions can be pretty creative. Um, and then understanding others' decision-making rights. Um, I imagine all of your campuses are a little bit different about uh, masking and distancing and that kind of thing. Um, so if you are in a place where people get to decide whether they are wearing a mask, um, uh, teaching students and honoring differences and, and talking about how um, we're when a choice is given that we have the right to make the choice that's right for us um, and honoring that. So not necessarily agreeing with it, but knowing that the person has the right to make that decision um, and uh, if appropriate, than talking about how that person is making that decision, why that person is making that decision. Uh, I see a question in there. So what types of relatively new services and supports that grew uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic and state home order will your institution retain? Oh, you wrote that for everybody. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> I will say for my institution, uh, my nonprofit that I run, um, we give people the choice um, to say what, what kind of precautions they wanna take. Uh, and then we pair people with staff who can support them with those same sort of um, uh, precautions. It's a great question. Okay. Um, so the third quote I have is from a student at UCLA. Um, this is written uh, in the Daily Bruin again last year because um, every campus has been going back at different rates. Um, 
So she said, this was an interview uh, transcribed from her. She said, there are lots of different disabilities that influence people in very different ways. And so when we factor in COVID, it has impacted different disabled people very, very differently. There's also a lot of things that have been super positive for disabled students when you talk about online access to things. This has been one of the first school years where I've legitimately felt like I've been able to access everything to the same ability as all my peers, which is which is really amazing. I feel like there's going to be definitely some sort of like grieving process when we go back to in-person and that's no longer the case. And I've been a huge advocate for hybrid options going forward because obviously I don't want to stay at home 24 seven, but I also want to be able to come to, still come to class when I'm not feeling well enough to leave the house. Um, so reading a little bit into that, I feel like maybe um, she's experiencing some medical um, issue where she wants to be able to learn, um, but physically isn't able to leave her home. Um, and what really stuck out to me in this one was um, her description of coming back to campus as being like a grieving process, um, that she's losing access to something that she felt um, really equalized her experience with her peers experience. Um, and now she's going back to something where she feels like that's not the case anymore. Um, I know this is not any of our, <laughs> none of us on here can probably make decisions about hybrid learning options, um, but I think it's very important to listen to students and potentially um, find some creative ways to do that. Um, so one of which goes back to that asynchronous synchronous learning if, um, you know, potentially there's a way uh, to give students some more independent study um, alternatives where you, they can watch that video that you made and they can do work um, on campus or at home or in a coffee shop or wherever they want um, and still be accessing that same content. Um, I think that that's worthy of exploring um, and it, it's certainly worthy um, to hear students talking about how hard this is for them um, and again those feelings and not shoving those feelings aside um, because we're just going to do things the way that we've already done things um, so in one of my roles that is related to this, I do a lot of consulting for students who are transitioning from high school to adulthood um, most of which uh, have some kind of developmental disability, if not all of them. Um, and right now I'm working with two families, um, both of whom have young adult sons with autism, uh, who they were sent home a couple years ago, uh, and they were accessing distance learning. They had somebody there at home to support them. Um, neither of them speak, um, so uh, non-speak people with the um, <laughs> non-speaking people with autism um, and both of them experienced an enormous amount of anxiety when they were asked to go back to school um, and so now even though both of their districts reopened in fall 2021 so last semester um, they have not their families have not been able to get them to go to school um, they're not going to physically force them because really what's the point in that um, and so you know their districts are calling it school refusal um, and really what I see is happening is that these students um, in both cases, even though they can't tell you, their families report that they were learning a lot more online, um, that they had both sort of experienced some kind of trauma on campus um, before COVID. Um, so one was about being restrained, um, you know, that kind of uh, horrible situation. Um, and when they were given the chance to not go to school, they don't wanna go to school. Um, so really, they're exerting their right to make a decision. They're both over 18. Um, even though they're conserved, they have the right to make decisions. So they're saying, no, thank you. I don't want to do that. Um, I don't care what you school tells me I need to do. I don't want to do it. I'm not feeling comfortable. Um, I, I am not going um, back to school. Um, so then we also are seeing experiences of a struggle between um, anxiety and their desire to return to campus. Um, so huge amounts of feelings about, I don't want to go back on the bus. I don't want to uh, see that teacher that I don't like. I don't want to see that kid that I had trouble with. Um, and oh my gosh, wouldn't it be cool to be back on campus and see everybody 
and my siblings are going, um, that it's, it's a big struggle for people and their families. Um, one of the other things that one of these person, people in particular has experienced um, is that because he's afraid of leaving his house now, um, that he can't get vaccinated because he can't go to the doctor's office. So he can't go to school. He would not be able to go onto campus um, to one of your schools because he his fear prevents him from going and getting vaccinated. Um, that may be different in a bigger city. He lives in a really, really small rural, rural town um, where someone is not going to come and see him. Um, he would have to go far away to see a doctor. Um, but we need to keep in mind, too, that this idea that someone um, is perceived as not wanting to go to school or not caring, maybe not be, it might not be that. It might be something is standing the way, standing in the way of um, that student returning to school. Um, so we can collaborate with families on small steps um, of helping that student get back into their community. And if the option is to go to school to do that, um, and especially in college, right, that's usually, it, it's not compulsory, right? This is much more uh, on an individual, you know, want to go basis or have a goal to go. Um, but if you're working with somebody who maybe is stuck in this whirlwind of I want to go, but I'm really scared and I hear all these things and uh, I certainly can't learn while my brain is is wrapped up in all that anxiety. Um, collaborating with the family can be really important um, on some small steps. Um, so maybe it's not coming to campus right away. Maybe it's. Um, uh, if they were taking the bus before, maybe it is taking the bus to some favorite place uh, that they really like to go, the movie theater or the mall or the beach or a uh, friend's house or something like that, um, and working up toward uh, returning to campus. Um, and that really shouldn't be held over somebody. Um, maybe it's not right for them to enroll in a class right now, um, but they can certainly talk to you, right, uh, as a, an instructor or a counselor and say, I want to come to school. Here's what's standing in the way. Uh, can you help me get there? Um, and then thinking too, are there any alternatives? Um, it, is hybrid learning an option depending on your, your situation? Um, are there online classes that may be a better fit? I know there's a lot through places like Coursera and things like that um, where students can still earn credit um, by doing online classes. Um, and then as well as a lot of your institutions are doing that too. Um, so maybe starting with online classes and then um, transitioning to taking the bus and um, doing fun things and then hopefully returning to campus someday. Um, and if not, that's fine too. A lot of people go to online school um, for their whole career and that's completely acceptable as well. Um, okay, so I just have um, the few resources at the end here and uh, we're almost at my 45 minute mark, so that was almost perfect. Um, and I'm happy to take questions. And um, I know there's been some chatting about captions. I'm sorry um, that that is not working for somebody. Um, but I am here to answer questions, have conversation. Um, so please feel free to put those in the chat. Thank you very much, Dr. Eric Day. So, um... A little while ago, I placed a question in the chat. I wanted to uh, get a sense of, are there uh, services and supports that have been provided to students in the midst of the pandemic that your colleges, universities, institutions will continue to provide? Like, what have we learned about new services and supports? What are some uh, supports that will continue into the future? Feel free to raise your hands. Um, I will unmute you and allow you to speak if you want to. I will also keep my eyes on the chat. Uh, and this is a great opportunity for you to um, share and ask questions as well. Okay, I see that someone uh, looks like, okay, oh, I see a number of hands. Just a minute. I'll begin with the first one that I saw. So, Sectino, is that right? I think you are. Um, you are muted, there you go. My apologies, that was, that was an accident. Sure. Comment or question? Oh, are you saying you didn't mean to raise your hand? Okay, so then I see um, there's Ben King with a comment or a question. 
Hi there, Molly. Um, thank you so much for the insight. Seriously, listening to you going over all of this has been so, I felt like alone with a lot of things, like a lot of questions and a lot of thoughts, but I feel like you kind of really brought that to light. Um, it's more of a general question, but can you can you tell us some other observations that you've made, other um, things that you've noticed on a day to day thing? You know, like because uh, what you were saying, it, it was just so helpful, and I just want to hear like other stories or other examples you can provide us of things that work and don't work. Yeah, Thank well, you for the question. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate the feedback. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so what I am trying to think now of specific examples, I think overarchingly. Um, a lot of work that I do is with uh, adults with autism and they are, they've been so lonely, so, so, so lonely. And um, going back to campus is so exciting. And then they get information that maybe it's not safe. Um, understandably, maybe they have, you know, a higher risk of, of becoming seriously ill or, you know, something's going on in the family or whatever. Um, and that it's a, a great like cognitive dissonance for people to try and be balancing that desire to be part of um, their society and their peer group again um, with this just overarching fear. Um, so I think for me, that is the most striking um, I, not finding, it's not research, but striking observation um, of, you know, this kind of population that we're talking about. So thank you so much for sharing. Great, and thank you for the question. I see a, a question from Rebecca Sims. Do you see instructions developing courses geared to meet the needs of students dealing with post-pandemic mental health issues, such as um, maybe different formats and strategies, et cetera? Um, yeah, so when people have the flexibility to do that, and I hope that all of you who are instructors have the flexibility to do that, yes, we see that a lot of um, educators wanting to, uh, they want to connect too, right? We all want to connect. Um, of, so really working with um, uh, how to incorporate that into academics, right? So if you're stuck with um, an hour or two long class that you're teaching, how can you incorporate that check-in and those moments of, you know, hey, let's stop what we're doing and talk about, uh, you know, uh, why I'm having a hard time today or why um, someone's feeling dysregulated or whatever, along with all the content that you have to um, incorporate. Um, so there are, I can send th some things to Will also, um, of what I've seen some teachers doing, because um, it's not stuff I've created, it's just awesome, awesome educators, um, and uh, how to kind of incorporate that into academics without um, compromising either um, topic. Absolutely. Um, and then in terms of like the technology and being flexible on that, um, I do see more people using um, some of the same online, you know, tech that was either developed or really explored during distance learning in their classrooms. Um, so having, I'm thinking of um, younger kids, um, oh my gosh, what's it called? Some of those little Quizlet, you know, sort of things that younger kids were using during distance learning, um, they're still using in person in the classroom. So they're using those digital skills, which are really important, um, and that sort of face-to-face -face thing. Um, and then uh, as well as on the college level, um, so using um, sort of hybrid one week in person, one week online, or um, online synchronous, online asynchronous, um, just some sort of combination that really allows everybody um, access. Yeah. Great. Thank you for that. So we're entertaining questions. Feel free to raise your hand and we will unmute you so that you may ask questions that you might have. Or if you don't want to voice your questions, feel free to drop them in the chat or in the Q&A. In the meantime, while we're waiting, um, Dr. Uh, Molly K. Rerig Day, thank you so much for sharing from the wealth of your knowledge and experiences um, and expertise with the California Community Colleges today. You bet. It's always a pleasure. And it's funny for, I got married in December and it's funny for me to hear both my last names now. <laughs> yeah. And I'm practicing, right? <laughs> thank, uh, you. thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Uh, ben said, congrats. Okay. So yeah, if there are additional questions, please feel free to raise your hand. Um, are there specific concerns that some of you have about some of the supports that you've been able to provide 
that you feel will go away now that we are moving more away from the pandemic. And, you know, I'm, I'm saying that guardedly because just this week I've spoken with some really close um, professionals and friends who just recently got COVID. So I'm even wondering uh, where you are in terms of your institutions with the transition back to in-person or not. So feel free to opine or you know comment on those kinds of things or other concerns that you have. I'm keeping my eyes on the chat and taking a look at raised hands. Don't be shy. <laughs> I see a hand. Um, I think it's, is it Ben King again? Uh, yes, yeah, sorry. I, I, I figured I might as well because uh, sure, yeah. <laughs> I, I have a lot of things I want to say, but I, I just wanted to give other people a chance to speak. Um, hybrid learning has been uh, an incredible uh, gift, to be honest, out of uh, everything I've noticed from the past two years. I work on um, community college campuses and it really offered a lot of my students um, opportunities to, you know, learn in different ways, as as uh, Molly highlighted, um, and some wonderful things. And there definitely was a grieving process uh, about going back in person, as, as we call it now. Um, so that's just one of the things that I feel is a shame that some of our schools are just completely getting rid of. They're like, okay, everything is open. We don't need to do online learning anymore when it really did provide a different type of um, uh, mode of communication or a mode of learning. Um, and that's something that I hope we can bring back to some capacity. So this is an observation I wanted to make. Great, thank you for that. Thank you, I agree. And I think what, what we read from those three students anyway, uh, is, you know, the uh, an overarching theme in this return. Um, and I'm curious, you know, I, I have taught at a community college, I haven't in a while, so I'm not sure what's going on in that realm. Um, but I think if you all as educators see that as a positive, then that's something that I'm sure you're advocating for uh, and that students would get on board with you. Um, you know, one of the most striking things I heard from my family member, um, so again, I, he has autism, he doesn't talk, uh, he types to communicate, and uh, he says he prefers online learning because there nobody knows knows he doesn't talk uh he, no one knows he has a disability he can write in the chat or you know write emails or whatever and th nobody knows uh unless he asks for accommodation so um i think that that's important to keep in mind as well um yeah, someone says, Brittany agrees, and uh, someone says many of the online classes fill up first. That speaks of what's going on, right? That's a, that's a good uh, case study, I guess. Oh, you're muted, Will. <laughs> sure. I, I will take uh, SP Molina's question first. Um, how does the tutoring play a part in the online courses? I'm not sure. Can you, are you able to unmute and tell ask or tell me maybe what you mean by that? Yeah, let's see if I can find SP. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So SP, you're unmuted. Feel free to. Thank you. I was trying to find the mute button. I'm like, where's the thing? <laughs> thank you. You guys have the power. Okay, so briefly, some of the systems we have uh, are tutoring needs, and I don't know what school per se used to, right? We have the option to see disabilities, tutoring if they need us, mass tutoring, um, biology tutoring. Are there being available via online or via Zoom? I think what I heard was, are, is tutoring available online? Um, and I'm not, I, I can't speak to different colleges. I'm not sure. I know some places, yes. Will, do you have additional information? Uh, well, while in the midst of the pandemic, yes, I know that um, some uh, tutoring, some mentoring, some education coaching uh, was occurring. Um, I, I'm not sure with with respect to specific institutions beyond 
college to career. I know that there were some other non-college to career campuses who indicated that tutoring was being provided. Um, if there are people still in the audience at community colleges where tutoring uh, is still occurring, please feel free to um, insert that into the chat for us. That might be helpful. Was there a specific institution that you had in mind, SP Molina? No, 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 basically, well, we still lay in other it's really, it's really difficult to hear what you're saying. Maybe can you can you type out? I know that might be a challenge. If you could, if you would type out what you're indicating, that might be helpful. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So uh, I noticed there are some comments in the in the in the chat. Uh, More Park College is doing online tutoring. Um, as well as it's happening, uh, seems like on the ground, face-to-face, -face, in person. Um, Kathy is saying they offer both online and in person. Kathy, what institution are you with? Uh, Rebecca also is saying that there's some um, tutoring on Zoom. Please indicate your institution as well, thanks. Pasadena City College is happening. It's happening at um, OCC. Great, thank you. Um, Taft College is offering uh, Zoom appointments for tutoring throughout Excellent. the pandemic and probably will continue. So there, yeah. Um, thank That's you great so much. To hear. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. All right, someone's asking, will the recording be shared for this webinar? The answer is yes. Um, yes, yes, okay. Okay, great. Other questions, um, please feel free to raise your hands, continue to raise your hands. That's great to hear. I'm re uh, reading in the chats about how many colleges are continuing online and on campus tutoring. And I think giving people the choice is really important. Okay, while we're waiting for additional questions, um, this does not mean that we are wrapping up yet. We have a few more minutes but I am going to drop here a link to the evaluation so that you could provide some feedback for us about today's uh, webinar. Um, as in addition to that, I've also put out um, a couple of doodle polls for a number of other uh, webinars um, addressing the mental health needs of students with IED and autism. Uh, so please feel free to be on the lookout for additional webinars as well. Um, I'm seeing that Moore Park College offers in-person new student uh, appointments and online appointments for tutoring. Great, this is wonderful. Uh, Dr. Rerig Day, uh, Elizabeth's comment, there's a concern that um, even though online classes provide great options for students with disabilities, she also finds that a lot of students in online classes are failing them at a higher rate. Hmm, that is concerning. Um, yeah, I get, I would be curious to know um, what is happening, like what, what supports maybe they're looking for that they're not finding. Um, is it students with disabilities who are failing or um, without or both or what's happening there? Um, I know that there's kind of a, a pull um, for people to sign up for online classes, regardless of disability or whatever, um, because they sometimes are seen as easier. Um, and we know that's not the case. And I, I'm curious how much that plays into that. Um, yeah, uh, so the students self report that they are not utilizing time management. My students are only the DSPS students. Yeah. Um, so then maybe some kind of hybrid thing if if you're able to do that um, would work better. Um, being uh, offering some on campus supports as well as off campus uh, digital. Um, it could be, um, I'm not sure whether you're doing it synchro synchronously or not, um, but I absolutely hear that too, that um, time management, especially if you're at home, is really hard because there's a lot of pull um, to do other things, right, to have fun and not <laughs> be working on your schoolwork. Um, so that, yeah, I hear that. Um, I'm curious what we can do to sort of um, make that a hybrid situation. 
Um, and so another person is saying, we've heard that time management has posed a steep learning curve for many of our students. So we've amped up time management workshops. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I used to teach a whole class about how to do that um, specifically for students uh, receiving DSPS services. Um, so those things can be useful also. Um, maybe some of that tutoring that people have talked about um, specifically about that. Yeah, I'm, I'm brainstorming here, but I'm wondering if there are um, maybe YouTube videos on time management techniques and skills that might be useful that could be used, you know, that are available around the clock when people might have the time to, to view and benefit from that. Yeah, I think we all benefit from that too. <laughs> I don't think anyone's perfect at time management, so it helps everybody. Thank you, Elizabeth. Great. So we have about one more minute. If you have had a burning question and you haven't, uh, oh, here, uh, we got a resource from uh, Jasmine Medina. Thank you very much. It's a, uh, another re uh, source for tutoring. Um, again, I was saying if there's a question that you've had, a burning question that you haven't asked, don't be shy. This is the time. We have one minute left. I just provided the link again to the, uh, so you could provide some feedback on this um, webinar today. All right, going once, going twice. Last question. Uh, is there a hand? There might be a hand. Ben, uh, no? Sorry, it was an accident, it is. sorry about that. Sure, of course. Okay. Dr. Rarick Day, again, thank you so much for being willing to share from the wealth of your wisdom, your expertise, and your knowledge with the California Community Colleges. It's always a pleasure. Thank you for doing this for us again today. Thank you so much for having me.